candidate for president who's ever been able to speak on this soapbox stage, and that's because the Libertarian Party of Iowa has done a lot of work to grow and thrive in this state. And I encourage you, first and foremost, if you're going to be hanging around the fair today, come inside. It's air conditioned. Come say hello to us at the LP Iowa booth. But what we are about in the Libertarian Party is, frankly, about freedom, distilled down to each and every individual. My promise to you as a presidential candidate is if I'm elected, if you're living your life in peace, you're not harming anybody, you're not causing any harm to anyone else, I don't care how you live your life because that's your business, not the government's business. And that's what I call common grace. If each and every person just allowed other people who live a little bit differently than them to live in peace, we would be a more peaceful people. But what we have right now is a two-party system that exists to divide us. And they're not being uh, responsive to the needs of the voters because they know the game is rigged for them right now. I liken two-party politics to professional wrestling. They pretend like they're fighting one another, but what they're actually doing is putting on a performance to get you upset, get you excited, to take your money, and to take your vote for granted, because that's what the two-party system does. We libertarians, we want to enter this race to be a check against the two-party system and to give you somebody honest to vote for. Now, you may notice I'm a little under the age of 80. I'm not quite as old as the presidential candidates in the other party. And that's because my generation, the millennial generation, are the people who really need to start running things in this new millennium. We have 20th century politicians who have been running the 21st century mechanisms of government for my entire adult life, and it's time for that to stop. And that's because my generation is the generation that got sent to fight the war on terror. My generation is the generation that had the entire real estate market fall out from underneath us right as we were getting started. It's my generation that is right now trying to raise families all over the country and all across Iowa with massive runaway inflation. And that is caused by the two-party system continuing to spend your dollars and to spend more money than they take in. And so the Federal Reserve prints money out of thin air. And when they do that, they devalue every dollar do you have in savings. That is a hidden tax on every single American, and libertarians will fight to stop that. As a presidential candidate, I want to balance our budget. That used to be a rational idea, but now in today's political climate, that seems to be a somewhat radical idea. We need to get back to the process of where our government is taking in or is spending less than it's taking in. And so my plan is to at least, if I'm elected, get Congress to get us back to pre-pandemic spending levels, back to fiscal year 2019 with our current revenues. That budget is balanced. It's not that radical. It's something we can actually do if there was political will to get it done. And you're never going to get that from a Republican or a Democratic candidate for president because they are too ingrained in the fact that this country is co controlled by highly, highly wealthy economic interests. They have bought and paid for your Congress. Let me tell you this, nobody has bought and paid for me. Nobody will buy and pay for a libertarian because we stand on principles. We are not political weather vanes like the Republicans and Democrats. We don't just blow with the political winds with whatever's popular, we stand on principle. I wanna give you a few examples of that. We have been around since 1971, the Libertarian Party. We have always been on the forefront of making sure that your taxes are low and your freedom is high. We've always been there to defend the Second Amendment. We don't step back from that at all. I know folks in Iowa do love their guns. Folks in Georgia love their guns too, and we want to make sure we're never, ever, ever stepping on your ability to defend yourself. Let's talk about some other areas where the government continues to fail us right now. In addition to the economy, which is the most important thing, this inflation that we're seeing run away with us, we also have a problem overseas. For my entire adult life, we have been fighting overseas in the war on terror. And I don't think that has made our country safer. What it has done is it has removed our ability to be able to work with people hand in hand in a market relationship. Right now, we are doing our foreign policy at the barrel of a gun. And that is not how you make friends. The way we're going to make friends around the world is by increasing more trade around the world, increasing free market principles, taking down trade barriers like tariffs, because those, again, are also a hidden tax on every single one of you. And I don't believe in protectionist policies. I know the American worker can stand up and compete around the world without BS tariffs that are making everything more expensive for each and every one of us. So I oppose trade wars. I don't just oppose trade wars, I oppose actual wars. We need to be pulling our military footprint back from every single continent outside of North America because we don't have any business fighting wars in every single continent other than North America. We can have the strongest, most military-ready military without having to be all over the world with bases all over the world. So we need to end our military footprint and, re and replace that 
with a market footprint where we're trading with people. Because I don't know about you, but if I'm buying something from someone, if I'm engaging in market trade, I don't really feel like shooting at them. I don't really feel like killing them, do you? That's what we need to be doing as a country, facilitating trade between countries and not just war between countries. So I also am a passionate defender of our ability to be on a level playing field with government in a court of law. At every step of the justice system right now, there is an unequal playing field that puts the power of government over you. And you can just see that as easily as if you look at how well-funded prosecutors offices are compared to the public defenders. Prosecutors sit in, you know, beautiful offices in Atlanta, they got, they got nice marble columns out in front of their office. The public defenders, they're shoved into a little closet basically. And what that does is that allows the government, when they want to prosecute you, to have more power over you, especially if you're somebody who doesn't have means. So I want to make sure that at every step of the justice system, we are reforming it. From the first time you have an interaction with a police officer, through the courts, and through every step of the way, so that we are actually treating people with empathy, and not just looking to use the justice system as an excuse to throw people away in jail. And I really want to stress this point. If you're doing harm, you're causing violence, you're stealing or coercing or creating some sort of theft from somebody, that's a crime. I want, the, I want there to be law enforcement for that. But what we have right now is an over-criminalized society. We have a war on drugs in this country that throws thousands of people in jail instead of helping them get the addiction help that they actually need. And there are real world examples of what happens when we get off of the drug war model and into a model that treats people with empathy. And that is actually a little nation called Portugal. I know if, you, if it's right there next to Spain and Europe, they used to have the worst HIV uh, rate in this continent of Europe. They used to have the worst IV drug use in Europe. They used to have a massive addiction problem. And the people of Portugal, they had to think to themselves, we can either fight a drug war and, and make this a punitive thing, like we do here in the United States, or we can do something different. We can treat people with empathy and compassion and actually work towards helping people get off of drugs and out of addiction. And so what they did is they decriminalized all drugs in the nation of Portugal. And they paired that with getting people the ability to seek addiction therapy. When you're not scared about getting arrested for being an addict, you're more likely to ask for help. But if we're stuck in this position where we are arresting people who are just sick with addiction, that leaves people in the shadows, that leaves people in jail that don't need to be there, and that hurts our country. I think we can do better than that. I wanna talk a little bit about community too. You know, uh, one of the things that we libertarians sometimes get falsely maligned and slandered with is the fact that we don't care about each other. They say we're selfish because we want our taxes low, we want what's ours, we want our business to be our business, we want our privacy. And some people say that's selfish. What's really selfish is not allowing people to have their own business, to have their own lives. What's really empathic is to say, hey, you might live your life a little differently than me, but as long as you're living it in peace, you can live that life and I'm not gonna fight you for it. And I'm certainly not going to use the government to fight you. This is why I oppose culture wars. I don't believe we need a culture war in this country. We need a cultural ceasefire in this country. Because again, I don't care how you live, who you love, how you worship, how you express yourself. If you do that in peace, that is your business, not the government's. But we're consistently divided along this ideological binary that exists between Republicans and Democrats. And what I'm telling you right now is I am sick and tired of the politics that says, you have to vote against this person. You better vote for me because otherwise that person's going to win. I will not be doing that in this campaign. I will be telling you why you should vote for liberty because frankly, that's more important to me. Everybody already knows the government stinks. Everybody already knows the government wastes your money with taxes. They take money out of your labor and they waste it both here and abroad. And we can do better if we bring that prosperity back home. I want to say this to the parents who are here today. I imagine that you have an unconditional love for your kids. I know that, right? Parents would take a bullet for their children. And so they are the best advocates for their children, not the government in DC, and certainly not the government anywhere else. Because while parents will treat their kids with that unconditional love, government will treat them like a number on a spreadsheet. That's all that matters to the bureaucrats, is that they get their they're, they want to make everything in their spreadsheets work out. They don't know you. They don't know your community. They don't know who you are. Your community knows that. So we need to be taking power out of the hands of these people in DC, these nameless bureaucrats who treat you like a number on a spreadsheet and bring power back to each and every individual here in Iowa and all over the United States. 
because that's where real power resides. It does not reside in the halls of government. The real power and real inherent liberty resides in each and every one of you. I want you to remember this as well. Your liberty is not given to you by the United States Constitution. Your liberty is given to you by the fact that you were born. It is inherent in you. The Constitution is meant to limit government and to limit their intrusion on our lives. And both parties, Republicans and Democrats, whenever they are in power, supersede that Constitution. They go outside of the Constitution. And what they are doing when they do that is they are attacking the inherent liberty you are born with. So I want to tell you a little bit about my biography. I want to tell you where I've come from and why I got to this position of supporting liberty for all people. I started out like most people as one of the other parties. I was originally a Democrat, and that was because I opposed the war in Iraq, and I thought, George Bush is the president. I guess I'm a Democrat by default. False political binary. So I fought really hard to get this guy Barack Obama elected in 2008. I know you guys have heard of him. He said he was going to end the wars. He was going to stop the drones. He was going to close Gitmo. And he was going to actually talk to our adversaries as opposed to just threatening them with war. He did none of that when he got elected. And he still got a Nobel Peace Prize. And so when I saw that happen, I knew I needed to peace out of the Democratic Party because they were not really an anti-war party. They were an anti-George Bush party. But as soon as their guy got in, they all of a sudden forgot about war. I wanted to organize against them and they said, but we got hope and we have change and we're gonna get healthcare out of this. And that's when I realized that those people who I was marching alongside with were more interested in attacking their political opponents than really standing up for people and standing against war. And so a couple of years later, I just happened to be at the Atlanta Pride Festival and the Libertarian Party of Georgia had a booth just like the Libertarian Party of Iowa's got a booth here and their candidate for governor. We have Iowa's former candidate for governor right here, Rick Stewart. But when I was in 2010, our candidate for governor, John Mons, was at the booth. He waved me in and he said, what is the most important thing to you? And I said, I oppose the war in Iraq with every fiber of my being. I want to bring all my friends home who are over there fighting. And he said, welcome home to liberty. And that's what I want to encourage all of you to do. If you want to support a life full of freedom, a life that is free from government intrusion so long as you're not harming another person, I welcome you home to liberty. Come home to liberty. And it's like, I may be from the South, it might be my evangelical roots a little bit coming out, but I love a revival. And that's what we have here in this country right now, is we have a point where we're about to have Joe Biden and Donald Trump be our Republican and Democratic nominees. And just this morning, CNN released a poll and they found that 69% of voters said they will never vote for Joe Biden or for Donald Trump ever again. And 75% of voters said they won't vote for Joe Biden ever again. That tells me there are a lot of voters out there who are looking for something different, who are sick and tired of the same old 20th century politicians in the 21st century. So I'm somebody who's gonna be fighting for your ability to be your best self have your prosperity and your life. I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the most important issues we've been having going on. We just got through the worst pandemic that we've had in a long time. And that pandemic was not necessarily bad because of the disease itself. It was bad because of our government's response to that pandemic. I have family members who lost their business due to arbitrary lockdowns. And I can tell you right now, there are people all over this country who had to say goodbye to their loved ones as they died through plate glass because they couldn't touch their loved one when they passed away. We need to have an advocate in the White House who remembers the next time something happens that we're not gonna arbitrarily lock down our country, we're not gonna force things upon people, we're gonna let peaceful people make their own decisions. And I think if we had done that, we would have had less people dying alone in nursing homes because of COVID. We would have had less businesses going under because government decided that your business is not essential. But those big box stores down the street those businesses are essential. And that's exactly what happened to a family member of mine. They had a flower shop and they loved it. They loved making flowers for weddings and, and corsages for prom and for funerals. They did all that stuff. But when COVID hit, they were told your business is not essential. You need to shut your business down. And her business did not survive. You know who did? The Lowe's down the road who has a garden center, they're selling flowers too. But they're considered essential because they have some certain items that the government said, well, we gotta let them be open. And so my family member, her business went under. Guess what she did for a little while to make money? 
worked at Lowe's in the garden center. So she lost her dream. She lost what she wanted. And then she was forced to work in giant corporate big box stores, making a lot less money, having a lot less freedom. I will never, ever stand for that as your president. If I'm elected, I will support your right to make those decisions. And that regards everything around your health care, too. If you want to take a vaccine, take a vaccine. If you don't want to take a vaccine, don't take a vaccine. That's your business. That's not my business. And that's certainly not the government's business. And so this pandemic, which has robbed us of so many civil liberties, is something that we need to fight back against. We need to roll back every single bit of power the government gave itself in the wake of the pandemic. That was the biggest mistake we made after 9-11. Government seized a whole lot of power to fight the war on terror, and we never, ever clawed it back. We cannot make that same mistake with COVID. Our next president has to be willing to fight back against those who would hold on to the power. I want to return the power back in each and every one of you. I have a great friend, Spike Cohen. He says, you are the power all the time. That's true. Power resides in you. Your liberty resides in you. And we need to fight back against a government that would take that from you. And that's exactly what they did in the wake of COVID. And it wasn't just one party or the other. It was both parties. It was a Republican president who started the lockdowns, and it was a Democrat president who continued them. We cannot afford either a Republican or Democrat in the White House in 2024. We have to demand something different. Because if we don't, you're going to get the same results that you've been getting your entire lives, which is more spending, more taxes, less freedom, and less autonomy for yourself. I want to take that out of the hands of those bureaucrats and give it right back to you. I want to talk a little bit about the biggest thing that's been going on in the world, the war in Ukraine. Now, I, again, I'm a peace candidate. I'm an anti-war candidate. I don't want our boots on the ground or our guns in the hands in Ukraine. I don't think we should be selling weapons as a government to Ukraine. Now, if you as an individual person, you want to go fight over there, go fight over there. If you want to buy weapons for them, you go buy weapons for them. But don't ask me to do it with my taxpayer money. What we should be doing as a country is actually talking about the humanitarian options we can have in Ukraine. If I were president, I would immediately say anybody in Ukraine who wants to get the heck out of there, we will bring into this country on an asylum and let them be a refugee out of the violence. Get them off the front line where the bombs are dropping. And then you make that same deal with every member of the Russian military. If you abandon the front line right now, we will let you come to this country on asylum. And you know what that's going to do? Destroy the morale of the Russian military and have them turn themselves right back where they came from. And we can end that war without the United States firing a single shot if we just have a little empathy for the people who are caught in the war zone and for the people who, frankly, on both sides are being conscripted into this war. We need to allow those people to come here as refugees and stop the war, not perpetuate a proxy war all over the world. And that is something as president I will commit myself to doing right here, right now. Lastly, uh, in terms of policy, I want to talk a little bit about the immigration, uh, in the immigration issue that we have in this country. We have millions of people who are currently here without documentation, who are working, they're starting businesses, they're living their lives as peaceful people. I want that to continue. And here's why. We need to have workers in this country. We need to have people in this country who want to start small businesses and who want to create prosperity. And immigrants do exactly that. What prevents immigrants from having the best life is our complicated immigration system. It's what allows us to keep workers in the shadows, which actually keeps wages lower for both Americans and immigrants, because these people are now being forced in the shadows. They're being exploited for their labor. I want Ellis Island style immigration. If you're coming here to work and be peaceful, come here to work and be peaceful. And in fact, if we have that system, more people will, exactly. And if you're coming here to work and be peaceful, it's not my business, right? But if you're coming here across this country to traffic people or exploit people, that is our business and we will crack down on that. But if we leave the peaceful people alone, we leave more time for law enforcement to actually focus on those who are really doing wrong. We have to put the eye on the ball. We can't focus on all of it because though most of those people are just peaceful people. So we really wanna fix the problems at our border, the worst exploitation of people. We allow those who wanna peacefully come here to work to do that. If you aren't aware, the children of immigrants in this country actually are the, uh, they at the highest percentage create small businesses in this country. They are part of the economic engine that makes our country thrive. One of the things that makes this country great, and we don't have to make America great, by the way, it's already a great nation, and here's why. Because we are the melting pot of the world. We are a diverse country that allows people to come here and do their best and make their best. 
and it doesn't matter where you've come from. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of all of his politics, but Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He came from out of the country. He came here from Austria. He says, I was born in Austria, but I was made in America. That's the immigrant dream of every person who wants to come to this country, including my ancestors and yours. They wanted to come to this country to make a better life for themselves. And that's what I think we need to facilitate, is a more open, empathic immigration system that treats people like human beings. I want to say thank you so much for guys allowing me to have a little bit of time to speak here today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the uh, fair. And again, come see us at the LP Iowa booth if you want to hear more. I'm happy to take your questions, but I will say the same thing I'd say to everybody. Have a great day of peace, love, and liberty. Thank you.